We have a guest speaker today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Pastor Jeremy is currently on paternity leave. Uh, they welcomed a new daughter into the world a couple weeks ago. Her name is Jolene, and we're all excited to meet her. Um, but until then, we wanted to give Pastor Jeremy and Kara a chance to, to be at home, to, to get to know Jolene, and for her to, to get to know them and to adjust to the new rhythm of life uh, that they have here. Uh, Mike has spoken at our church three times already, uh, which I believe makes him our current record holder as a guest speaker. Um, I'm so blessed by Mike's heart <laughs> and his passion for teaching and discipleship. I know he has a timely and important message to share with us today. Uh, Mike is another one of these energy guys that I feel so uncomfortable around, but I need in my life. Uh, and so I'm excited to hear from him. Uh, Mike has served in churches in Detroit, Houston, and Phoenix. He's been on the preaching teams of churches in Pittsburgh, St. Louis, and here in Illinois. Mike started and led the largest youth adult ministry in Aurora, Illinois for seven years, and he is sought after as a guest speaker in churches all over the U.S. And finally, he wanted me to mention that he is a self-proclaimed donut and burger connoisseur. So if you want to throw down with him to see, you know, who really knows more about burgers and donuts here in uh, Chicago, feel free to do that. Track him down. I'm, I'm excited to have him here with us this morning. Please welcome Mike Alvarez. Thanks, guys. Good morning, everybody. How is everyone doing? I hope everyone's doing good because I think it's going to be a good morning. Uh, hey, Jeremy here, Kara. I hope you guys are doing great. Um, congratulations on you guys. This is an exciting time for both of you, and the family's getting bigger, and the church is growing. Hey, the church is growing because Jeremy's adding to it. So we're really excited about that. Um, hey, if you have a copy of your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 7. Mark 7. We're going to look at something I think that's pretty interesting. And while you guys are turning there, I just want to say, uh, first of all, thanks to Jeremy for inviting me to come and speak. I didn't realize I had broken records here already, and I'm doing this, and I feel pretty excited because there are very few records in my life that I break. And so just showing up here, hanging out with you guys is pretty awesome. So thanks for letting me come here and hang out with you guys. Also, this uh, building is pretty amazing. I don't know, for some of you guys that maybe have not seen this building, it is actually really, really cool. And I hope that you guys can make it out to July 11th to this meeting because if for anything, it's the Popeye's chicken. I'm just telling you, like, I want to show up because of the Popeye's chicken. So, I mean, you got the butter biscuits the chicken sandwiches. Come on, church. Like, this thing is real. So, look, I got, I got an applause again. This is great. So, please make sure you come out here for that, because um, to give you a tour, they gave me a tour of the building uh, a little bit ago, and really, really cool stuff. So, I'm excited for you guys. God is going to do some great things through Uptown Church. So, pretty pumped up for you guys. Hey, if you have your Bibles, and hopefully you are there already to Mark chapter 7. We're going to look at a really interesting passage here. And something that maybe you have either read through and they've just passed over. But hopefully uh, today um, we can talk about it. And uh, hopefully um, this will speak to you. Now let me just say this to you. If, uh, if you're watching live right now, if you have a friend that you're like, hey, this guy, he's really weird. Um, and but I think you should listen to him. I want you to text somebody right now. Tell them to tune in because I think this is going to be a really great talk for some people to really understand uh, this text that we're going to be looking at. So text somebody, DM someone, run over to their house, like pull them out, turn on the TV for them. Uh, just get them watching this because I think this will be really good. Mark chapter 7, starting in verse number 14. And this is how it reads. I'm reading out of the NIV. It says, again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. I want to talk to you from the subject of where does evil begin? Where does evil begin? Would you pray with me? Father, I pray that in the next few moments that you would talk to us. 
God, that you would speak very deeply into every heart and into every life, I pray. Father, that you would move us from a place of mediocrity to a place of real change. God, that we would be the people that you have called us to be. And Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross this morning and that the name of Jesus would be lifted up and that all men would be drawn to you. God, I thank you for this. We ask all of this. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. It was around July of my 10th birthday. Um, I was about 10 years old and my mom came up to both my brother and myself and said, guys, what would you like for Christmas? Now, here's what's interesting about this, and I know this is in the middle of July, but you have to understand that I grew up in a single parent home. And so mom worked a couple of jobs. So it took mom a little bit to have to save up for Christmas. I mean, some of us know that if you grew up in this kind of environment, my mom had to save up a lot of money for our Christmas gifts. My mom said, choose three gifts, each of you. And she says, I'll pick one of them. And then that's what you'll get for Christmas. So what I wanted, I didn't even choose three. I just, I knew what I wanted. I wanted a gold buggy remote control car. That was the thing I wanted so badly. I always wanted a remote control car. So my mom said, okay, fine. So we got in the car. We drove over to Toys R Us. Remember this? Toys R Us, great store. We walked in, we walked to the aisle where the remote control cars were. And the cool thing about this was that this was the kind of remote control car that was behind a glass window. In fact, you had to go up to it and you had to unlock the glass window, slide it over, and then the employee would come, take out the remote control car, and present it to you. Like, this was the kind of remote control car I wanted. So we go up to the window. My mom said, which one do you want? I knew exactly which one I wanted. I pointed it to it, and I said, I want that one right there. It was on the top shelf. It was set in the middle of like four or five other remote control cars. And it was this beautiful black and gold buggy, off-roading, remote control car. I wanted it so badly. And I said, Mom, I want that one. She said, okay, fine. The employee came out, pulled it out, and then we took it to the back. And so this is what my mom did. Because it was in the middle of July, my mom did a thing, and you might be familiar with this. She put it on what's called layaway. Remember this? Layaway. It was that, you know, my mom would go every month and make payments on this remote control car. And then come Christmas time, she would have paid it off and then we'd go ahead and pick it up. So every single month from the time July to December, my mom would show up at Toys R Us and she would slap down a payment And she'd say, like, Mike, you're going to get this remote control car. And I was so excited and so pumped up for this. And then December comes around. My mom pays off the remote control car. She brings it home. And I'm so pumped up for this. And then she pulls out Christmas wrapping paper. She's about to wrap it. I said, wait, 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 mom, wait. Like, would you just let me try it out? Just, Just to make sure it works. Right? I just want to make sure we're not getting a dud here. Like, I want to make sure it works. My mom said, no, Michael, you are not going to open up until Christmas Day. And I said, Mom, please. Like, you got to let me just try it out. She's like, no, Michael, we're going to wait till Christmas Day. I was like, Mom, I'm your son. Like, you love me, don't you? And she's like, I love you, but if you keep on asking, you are not even going to open it up on Christmas Day. She's like, just settle down, relax, take a chill pill, go to the other room. Like, let me just wrap up your gift. So she wrapped it up, and my mom put it in her closet. She didn't even put it under the tree. She put it in her closet because she didn't trust me. She put it in her closet. So every day, I would sneak into my mom's bedroom, and I would slide open the closet door just to take a peek at this remote control car that eventually I was going to open it up. Christmas Eve rolls around. I'm so pumped up about this. We're all as a family heading over to my aunt and uncle's house to go celebrate Christmas Eve with the whole entire family. And we were there till about 1130 midnight. 
And then everybody kind of excused themselves and we got in our car and we drove home. And I was excited because we were just minutes away from midnight, which meant that we were going to be on Christmas Day. And I was just so pumped up about this. So I remember my brother and I running to the front door, unlocking the front door, running into the house. And as soon as I walked in, me and my brother noticed something really strange. We noticed that sitting in the middle of my living room floor was our computer keyboard just sitting right there. Now, what was interesting about this is that we had two cats in the house. And we thought to ourselves, did our cat drag out our computer keyboard in the middle of the floor? Like, that's just so weird. And so we're just kind of standing there, both my brother, myself, and my mom, and we're standing there just kind of looking around, and then we glance over at the TV, and the TV is turned backwards. And we couldn't figure out, why is our TV backwards? And then we noticed that there was wires hanging out from underneath the TV, and we noticed that our VCR was missing. And then we walked further into the house, and as we walked further into the house, as soon as you walked into the house, you could see directly through the house. You could see into the dining room and into the kitchen. And what we noticed on the dining room table were these crowbars laying on there. And we thought to ourselves, that's really weird. We don't own crowbars. And as we looked further back Into the kitchen, there was a back door that led outside of the kitchen into the backyard. And what we saw were three men running out of the back of our house. What we had realized was that someone had just broken into our home and had stolen stuff. And the first thing I thought of was my remote control car. I ran into my mom's bedroom and I slid open the closet door and you could hear the plastic rollers as that squeaky sound of a closet door being slid across. And I remember looking into the closet and uh, the thing I saw was the imprint of the box of my remote control car sitting on the carpet that it was gone. They had stolen my remote control car. And I remember running to my mom and I told my mom, Mom, they stole my remote control car. My mom just cried and she wept. Evil is a really bad thing, isn't it? It's amazing how much bad things exist in the world today, isn't it? You and I turn on the TV and we see evil happening around the world and we think to ourselves, how can this be? How can this go on? How can this continue in life? We see this happening all over the place and the question no longer is, is there evil in the world? The question really becomes, where does evil come from? Where, where is the origination of evil? I find it interesting that in these days, psychologists and therapists are, are no longer defending extraordinary evils that's done by extraordinary individuals with extraordinary circumstances. What they're admitting is that these days that seemingly normal people are being engaged and entertained by vile and horrific things. That normal people are just doing extraordinary evils in the world. I mean, you flip on, you know, YouTube and you flip on uh, Netflix and you see stuff. You're like, wow, I can't believe that's on these networks, on these streaming lines, on these streaming channels. And you just wonder, like, how is this possible? And the reality is that, that evil is pervasive throughout society. Even extraordinary people can do extraordinary things that are corrupt. It's amazing when you realize this. What's interesting is that in 2007, there was a book written called The Lucifer Lucifer Effect. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but it was called The Lucifer Effect. It was written by a psychologist by the name of Philip Zimbardo. And in this work entitled The Lucifer Effect, the subtitle was How Good People Turn Evil. 
He concluded that this pervasive, far-reaching problem in our, in our society is environmental, he said. That what corrupts us is outside of us. We are all exposed to hostile and acidic situations. Our proclivity for evil is an overexposure to things that are outside of us, he says. Now, here's what's interesting about this, is that this is actually in direct contradiction to the Bible. In fact, Jesus addresses this issue, and Scripture addresses this issue. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things. In other words, you can't trust your heart because your heart will deceive you. How many of you have ever experienced moments in your life where your heart lies to you? In fact, there are moments in your life where you will walk into a room that you, you feel like, man, I don't belong here. I don't fit in here. There's nothing good for me to say. No one will listen to me. I'm either too tall or too short or too big or too small. I'm not smart enough or I'm too smart or whatever it is, our heart will tell us things and deceive us and make us think certain things. Jeremiah says, your heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? He's speaking to the collective group of people. He's actually talking to the collective heart. He's talking to everyone. People are wicked. In fact, the Bible says there is no one righteous, not even one. According to James chapter 1, verse 14, he says this, But each one of you is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. See, we are capable of conceiving evil in our hearts and turning it into sinful attitudes that ultimately become sinful acts, and in some cases, deadly sinful acts. Sin works its way from the inside out. Think about this for a moment. Basically, what is defiled is what's on the inside, not what's on the outside. As a society, we do not want to admit this. It, it's really funny because uh, when, you, when you look at society and you look at the way we think, we don't admit that evil is on the inside of us. What's wrong is on the inside of us. We say it's on the outside of us. And the reason why society doesn't want to admit that is because to admit it, has to, you have to at some point take ownership of it. You are now responsible for this thing. We see interviews often. I know I like to watch interviews. I tend to watch documentaries. And I'm really fascinated by um, people that have done really heinous crimes. And I love to watch the documentaries on those to see how that unfolds. You can watch this like on 2020 or 60 Minutes or something like this. And whenever you see these interviews take place, they're interviewed over their odd, weird, crazy, unruly behavior and when they're asked the question, why did you do it? Generally, their answer looks something like this. They'll say something like, I was misunderstood as a child. I was molested as a child. I was denied privileges as a child. I was unloved as a child. I was bullied as a child. And they relate that all, to all these behaviors have been created because I lived in a, quote, toxic environment. Now, before Jeremy gets any emails or phone calls and forwards them on to me, let me just say this to you. Let me just be clear about something. I'm not suggesting for a moment that these aren't bad situations. They are horrific situations, in fact. In fact, I would say that I am the recipient and a product of those situations in my own personal life. Before I was born, I was rejected. Mom tried several ways to end her pregnancy of me. She would try different ways to eliminate me from her life. Throughout the course of my childhood, I was told, quote, cursed or black was the day that you were born, Mike. I was told that over and over again on my birthday. 
My father left when I was three months old after nine years of marriage to my mom. I was molested from the age of three to ten years old. I was physically, mentally, and sexually abused. I never had a true friend till I went to college. I was socially inept. And then one of my closest friends before walking out of my life said, Mike, we are only friends because you pursued me. I would never pursue you. No doubt that there is more than enough reason for my environment to dictate my behavior. But what's interesting about this is that Jesus addresses this issue. He speaks to this. I want you to look at this again. Mark chapter 7 verse 14. He says, again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you dull? He asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. In seeing this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For within, out of men's hearts, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. And all these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Several times the word unclean, if you notice this, several times the word unclean shows up in this text. It means dirty or impure or corrupt or defile. The word unclean or defile is used frequently in the New Testament, but it's actually used more in the Old Testament. In fact, it's used more than 225 times in the Old Testament. Why is this? Because the idea of clean and unclean is a biblical issue. In fact, Jesus is concerned about this. It's a big deal to God. Throughout Scripture, we're encouraged to distinguish the difference between clean and unclean. You see, the Jews were very aware of the idea of clean and unclean. In Jesus' day, this is interesting, in Jesus' day they had developed a very sophisticated external religious system that went beyond the laws of God. They would adhere to the laws of God as much as possible. They would follow ceremonies and they would follow rituals and they would follow all the rites that God had ordained in in the Levitical laws, but they added many more onto it. In fact, literally hundreds of prescriptions were added to the laws of God. This is really crazy. And out of this came the notion that defilement or uncleanliness was something outside of them. They were under the illusion that inside they were good and godly people. You could say that that was the thinking of the Pharisees of that day. Remember this story in Luke chapter 18? There was a Pharisee who was in the temple and he begins praying and right next to him is a tax collector and he begins to pray this prayer to God and really, he's really praying this prayer to himself. He says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. What he is saying is the bad thing is outside of me. The bad thing is right next to me. And if I let that bad thing get near me, it will pollute me. This is what he's insinuating in all of this. And they thought that if I gave my tithe, if I fasted, if I did all the right rituals, then I would be good. Isn't that kind of like the same thing we think about in our culture? That if I'm not like that person, if I don't, if I'm not racist, 
then I'm good. If I, if I feed homeless people, if I serve my community, if I do all these things, then I'm good. I don't want to be like those people because those people are, are bad. I would rather be like me. And in so many ways, we justify ourselves because we think that if I'm not like what's around me, then I'm good. And we deem ourselves good. You see, this was the illusion they lived under. Paul lived under this same illusion as well in Philippians chapter 3. I'll let you read that for yourself, but this is what he believed. They all thought that they were good on the inside, and everyone that followed them all thought the same thing. This thought was pervasive all over the land of Israel. They all thought they were good on the inside, righteous on the inside. They went to synagogue. They observed, they observed all the traditions of the elders. They followed the rituals and the ceremony, ceremonial washings. And they did all of this stuff. And they felt that they were good and righteous on the inside. The only thing, watch this, the only thing that they had to be afraid of, the only thing that they had to be scared of was something on the outside. Because the inside was fine. This was the illusion. They thought that the only thing that would defile them was something on the outside that might eventually pollute them. They thought that they were holy. They thought that they were good. So in order to maintain this, they just always had to make sure that they never went anywhere that corrupted them. This is what they did. You see, this is what's behind Jesus' teaching, the lesson he's teaching here. You see, in a system of salvation by works that sometimes people live under that, that if I do good enough, God will want me. That if I live right, that God will want me. If I don't think the way they think, that God will want me. That if I give enough money in the offering, that if I give my tithe, that if I serve at church, that if I do these things, whatever you deem as good, that if I do those things, then, then I'm qualified to go to heaven. I'm qualified for God to want me. In a system of salvation by works or a, a system of self-righteousness, we think we earn our way to God. And here's what Jesus does, is Jesus shatters that idea in this text. He's going to teach a lesson on the inside story of defilement. The inside story on cleanliness and uncleanliness. Look at this real quickly again. He says this in verse number 14. He says, listen to me, everyone. Now, let me pause here for a moment. And he says, listen, this was a thinking throughout all of society. This was a common thought. So Jesus isn't just addressing certain groups of people. He is addressing everyone. He says, hey, listen, if you have an ear to hear, then you need to hear me. For those of you standing in the back, he's saying, I need for you to pay attention to what I'm about to tell you. Because this is absolutely vital. Listen to me, everyone, and understand. He says, I need for this to make sense to you because this is absolutely vital he says i want to lay a foundation you have believed this way of thinking for so long but i want to give you a new way of thinking and when you understand this this will change your life he says nothing outside of man can make him unclean by going into him rather it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean you see, what Jesus is getting into here, what he's getting at, is he's spiritually speaking. He's not speaking of something physical. He's not talking about real food. He's talking about something spiritual. He's saying pollution doesn't go into you. It comes out of you, is what he says. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it says, A man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. 
right? He looks at our heart. He understands how our heart works. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Keep your hearts with all diligence, for from it flows the spring of life. Listen, this is what the writer of Proverbs understands. He says that at the center of who you are, you and I cannot trust our hearts. Because our hearts are deceptive. So we always have to keep our hearts in check. You see, the heart is evil. That is the issue that Jesus is getting to. Jesus is getting to the heart of the issue here. This is absolutely important. Isaiah says this, that in in Isaiah chapter 6... He says that he is a man of unclean lips. Why does he say that? Because what he's doing is he's identifying the wretchedness of his own heart. He's talking about what's going on inside of him. This is the principle that Jesus is teaching. Watch, get this. That evil does not come into you from the outside. It comes out of you from the inside. Evil does not come into you from the outside. It comes out of you from the inside. He goes on to say this in verse number uh, 17. He says, after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Now, here's what's interesting about this. In verse 14, Jesus kind of, kind of, uh, kind of throws out some salt and he's trying to make them thirsty and he says I need for you to understand this what's interesting about this in verse 17 the disciples follow up and they say Jesus tell us more Jesus is interested in those that want to understand and so he lures them in and so they say hey Jesus tell us more about this and so he goes on to say this verse 18 he says are you so dull I love this statement. Now, in Scripture, this sounds really harsh. I'm going to be honest with you. It sounds really harsh. But what Jesus is really saying is like, guys, this is easy. Don't complicate this. This is not a complicated situation. This is actually easier than you think. But what you've, what's been taught to you has complicated things. He says, I've come to uncomplicate all of this stuff. And then he goes on to say this. He says, don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean, for it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. Now, let me just say this. Now, as you read this, we all understand that Jesus is saying something that's kind of like, we don't really talk about this in church. We don't really talk about this from a platform with the person holding a mic. But we understand what Jesus is talking about, right? He is basically talking about like what, go, what you eat comes in one way and then goes a different way. All right? We, we understand this, right? Goes into the stomach, comes out another way, right? So like we, we understand this, okay? This makes sense. And Jesus is saying, that's not what I'm talking about. Because he's saying it doesn't affect the heart. This is, Jesus is spiritually speaking to this situation. And then he says this in verse number 19. For it, it, for it doesn't go into the heart, but into the stomach and then out of his body. Verse 20. It says, he went on, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean for from within out of men's hearts comes every evil thought every thought that you've ever thought that didn't line up with God God says that's evil that's wrong this is where it comes from it comes from your heart he says this he says sexual immorality your passions your desires your wants he says this all comes From that theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Now, here's what's interesting about this. Is that we have a saying in our culture that goes something like this. I love you with all of my heart, right? 
put all your heart into it, right? That person broke my heart, right? The heart wants what the heart wants, right? We've all heard these sayings, don't we? It's really interesting that, you know, whenever we say that, we're not talking about I love you with my blood pumping muscle, are we? We're not saying that. What we're really saying is I love you with the center of who I am. I love you with the area of my life that I deem as the headquarters of my life, the epicenter of me, right? Everything about decisions that I make is filtered through my heart right? Jesus, God, understands this. This is why it's very interesting that when the scriptures say in Matthew, he says, um, he says, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So in other words, Jesus is saying that whenever I want to find the center of who you are, whenever I want to find the, the, your, your decision-making filter, he says, the only thing I have to look for is the thing that you value the most, right? If I want to find you, I just got to find the thing that you value the most. You see, Jesus is after our hearts, You know who else is after your heart? The enemy of your soul. He is after the very thing that you use as the filter to make decisions in your life. That is the center of who you and I are. And that's what God is after. He is after our hearts. Because he knows that that is where, in essence, evil comes from. Because we are corrupt by nature. You say, Mike, what do I have to do about this? Like, what needs to change? What do I do about this condition? Well, it's a simple answer. You need a new heart. That's what we need. We need a new heart. Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 25 tells us this. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you and I will give you, watch this, a new heart and a new spirit I will pour within you and I will remove the heart of stone and your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. God desires to give you and me a new heart. He desires to change us from the inside out. This is what he wants. Nicodemus, in John chapter 3, remember this story? Nicodemus goes up to Jesus and tells him, Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus, in essence, tells him, you need a new heart. Right? Because what you have on the inside is corrupt. Your core is corrupt. And so you need a new inside. This is the newness of God. This is the salvation of God. This is God trying to cleanse us and heal us from all of this. But those of us that have walked with God and we've allowed our hearts to entertain desires that are wrong, that are hurtful, that are destructive, desires that are impure, the wants that are unhealthy, What do we do? We're going to close here in a moment. But Psalm chapter 51 tells us this. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. There is this understanding that You aren't good by yourself. No matter how good you try to be, we are not good. There is evil in our hearts. But God says this can change. This doesn't have to be this way. The only thing that we have to do is we say, God, listen, I have have gone my own way. I've tried to live life good. But in reality, God says that no matter how hard you try at the core of who you are, we, we have an evil heart. And God says the only way that that can change is if we get a new heart from God. 
For those of us that maybe are far from God today, and you say, Mike, you know, I've never really given God a chance in any of this, but what you're saying is absolutely resonates with me. And Mike, that's what I want. I want a new heart. Now, we're not talking about a physical new heart. We're talking about a spiritual heart. That what comes out of you, all the decisions that you make, the things that you do, the things you've thought about, the places you go to, you say, Mike, I'm tired of this. I've made some bad choices and some bad decisions. I want to begin making right decisions, to begin making better decisions about life. And so you just have to come to this point where you say, God, come into my life. Forgive me of everything I've ever done. God, I want my heart to be right with you. God, would you give me a new heart? And would you help me to live right? If that's you today, I want to encourage you to pray that prayer. God, forgive me of everything I've ever done. Come into my life. Renew me from the inside out. I want to be born again, like the way Nicodemus talked about. I want to encourage you to get plugged in to Uptown Church, to grow in your understanding of this. Jesus talked about he wanted everyone to listen and to understand. And the way you and I grow is if we take time to put ourselves in environments where we take time to understand who God is. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. And for those of us that maybe we've, we've lived this Christian life, but lately we've been making behavioral decisions that have begun to turn our direction. That they're small decisions. They're not big decisions. They're small decisions that slowly have kind of, we've veered off the path. And so for some of us, we just need to begin making decisions that kind of put us back on. You say, well, Mike, I don't feel God. I don't sense God around me. I get that, and I totally understand that. I just want to encourage you that whatever took you a season to behave your way out of will take you a season to behave your way back in. And it will take you moments in which you say, God, I need for you to renew my heart, just as the writer of Psalm says in Psalm 51.10. God, create in me that new heart and renew a right spirit in me. If that's you and you said, Mike, I've made some decisions. I go to church. I pay my tithe. I do stuff. I'm involved. But I've made some decisions that are kind of like, man, I can notice there's some bad stuff that's already starting to seep in there. If that's you. And not, not only am I wrapping my mind around this, but I'm also wrapping my heart around this. God, I pray that you would encourage those that are watching this morning, today. Lord, and that for those, Lord, that have made decisions, that have, that, that have allowed areas of their life to maybe be corrupted, Father, I pray that they would sense your love, your forgiveness, and Lord, they would begin making decisions that would pull them closer to you. God, I pray that they would see this as an opportunity to get involved here at Uptown Church. Lord, and that they would continue to grow, continue to submit, Lord, to continue to find accountability for their life. God, I thank you for all of this. We ask all of this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.